Big banks get caught flat-footed as the economy wobbles. They make the wrong bets with customer money. They can't cover their obligations, and the federal government is forced to step in. If you lived through 2008 and the Great Recession, you've heard this story before. But 15 years later, it does feel like history is repeating itself. With the failure this month of Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, the second biggest bank failure in American history. True to its name, the bank's depositors included startup founders, tech moguls, and major online companies like Roku and Etsy. It all added up to billions of dollars in investments, money that the bank gambled on a pretty safe investment, long-term government bonds. But as the Fed raised interest rates to fight inflation, those bonds lost billions in value, and the money was tied up until the bonds matured years from now. So SVB announced it was selling off assets and stock in order to cover its obligations. And that spooked a lot of bank customers into withdrawing all their money. More money than the bank had in the bank. And SVP crumbled. When the government stepped in, it didn't just give depositors back their first $250,000. That's the deal you and I get when we go to the bank. But you and I aren't tech moguls who can create bank runs with a tweet or a group text. All customers who had deposits in these banks can rest assured. I want to rest assured they'll be protected and they'll have access to their money as of today. Now, the White House has said not to call it a bailout, that it's not going to cost taxpayers, but will come out of an FDIC fund provided by big banks. But it will make all the depositors whole, no matter how much they sunk into SVB. If that's not a bailout, it's certainly a gift. And the SVB failure has already spread, with feds forced to take over Signature Bank after a run by customers there, and now the third biggest bank failure in U.S. history. And another regional bank, First Republic, on the ropes, seeking a rescue plan from the bigger banks. But how do we get here again? Banks making bad decisions with customer money, banks that are apparently too big to fail. It's just a kind of disaster that Congress hoped to prevent after the last recession and crash with the Dodd-Frank banking reform. That law, signed by Barack Obama in 2010, required most banks with more than $50 billion in assets to show the government they had plenty of cash on hand to ensure that no more banks needed a federal rescue because they were too big to fail. But operators of many regional banks wanted an exception, saying they weren't that big and they wouldn't fail. Among them, Greg Becker, the longtime CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. In 2015, he wrote to the Senate Banking Committee, urging them to relax the law, quote, because SVB's business model and risk profile does not pose systemic risk, imposing the numerous Dodd-Frank requirements that were designed for the largest bank holding companies would place an outsized burden on us with minimal corresponding regulatory benefit. And the CEO got his wish in 2018 under then-President Donald Trump with a new law that CNBC called the biggest roll bank of bank rules since the financial crisis. Instead of putting any bank larger than $50 billion under that heightened scrutiny, the roll bank raised the threshold to banks larger than $250 billion, five times the size. That worked out great for SVB, which had $209 billion in assets last year, under 250. 17 Senate Democrats voted yes on that bill, but others warned at the time it was a risky path. Just yesterday, the Congressional Budget Office told us that the legislation we are debating today will, and I quote, increase the likelihood that a large financial firm with assets of between $100 billion and $250 billion would fail, end of quote. That's the CBO. In other words, this legislation makes it more likely that we will see another financial crisis, makes it more likely that there will be another huge taxpayer bailout and massive dislocation of our economy. Wow. Pretty prophetic from Bernie there. Now, Senator Sanders and other Democrats want changes. As Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren wrote in the New York Times last week, had Congress and the Federal Reserve not rolled back the stricter oversight, SVB and Signature would have been, subje would have been subject to stronger liquidity and capital requirements to withstand financial shocks. They would have been required to conduct regular stress tests to expose their vulnerabilities and shore up their businesses. But because those requirements were repealed, when an old-fashioned bank run hit SVB, the bank couldn't withstand the pressure. There you have it. We had a law for this, a law that was clawed back, many would argue, by special interests under Donald Trump. Feels like it's well past time to bring it back and make our bankers, all of them, 
responsible again. Joining me now, though, is former Alabama Senator Doug Jones, who served on the Senate Banking Committee and was one of the 17 Democrats who voted for that Trump-era rollback of bank regulations in 2018. Senator, thanks for coming back on the show. Always appreciate talking to you. Last week, Elizabeth Warren told my MSNBC colleague Rachel Maddow that the 2018 rollback of bank regulations helped get us here. Have a listen. Congress needs to roll back the Trump Tack, uh, the Trump bank regulation relief. We need, to, we need to make a change in the laws because then that will affect the regulators and the regulators will make sure that they are engaging in closer supervision over those banks. And that in turn will rein in any of the CEOs that think banking is a great place to get a multi-million dollar salary and a bunch of bonuses and your own jet plane. I mean, she's not wrong, is she? I mean, when you cast your vote for that 2018 bill, what was your reasoning? Why did you think backing a Trump deregulation bill was the right way to go? Well, first of all, Maddie, uh, I, I disagree with so much of your initial monologue on this. This is nothing like the banking crisis of 2008. It is apples and oranges. In that situation, you had credit risk with bad loans across the board, the housing market and everything else. SVB did not have that. It had less liquidity because you had too many investors that were not insured. I like 95 percent of their uh, assets were not insured. So this is nothing like 2008. That's number one. Number two is if you listen carefully to what Elizabeth said, a stress test may or may not have caught this. What she essentially said was, if you have this, then the regulators are going to, by nature, take a closer look. The problem that you have with the SVP that I'm seeing is that you had regulators that had the ability to see the stress that was on this bank without a, a, a stress test. Number one, they could have done it because they had the discretion to impose that if they had done the job appropriately to, in, in the very first place. That is what we've got. When, when you talk about the fact that it's, we deregulated banks, we didn't deregulate banks. All banks are subject to very strict scrutiny and very strict regulation still to this day. What we, what we did was raise the, raise the threshold for mandatory enhanced supervision that was really hurting so many community banks that are still operating today. This is not a banking crisis like we had in 2008. And the bottom it's, line is we need to see, it, hang, I, on a minute, hang on a minute, we need to see what the real causes are, because I've said this all along about the banking bill. If, in fact, it needs to be tweaked, there's nothing sacred in that bill, Matty, and they need to tweak it. They need to do it. But to completely roll it back is going to put such burdens on the mom and pop banks around this country that it would be devastating to consumers. It's interesting that you use the phrase mom and pop banks, because I wonder, I mean, how come this current crisis, these current problems are really only hitting these mid-sized banks who got the benefits of that rollback in 2018? Even the big bloated banks are not suffering, are not at risk in the same way. Is it just a coincidence in your view that it's exactly the same group of banks that benefit? It's the same guy, Becker, who was calling for this, that are the ones who got hit recently? Is that a coincidence? What? Look, there are some bankers that are going to be greedy and do things that they shouldn't do, even under the nose of regulators. What we are seeing, though, we have we've seen two banks that have failed. Others are looking at where they are right now, because one of the things that they did not anticipate when all of this was happening with low interest rates, some banks have gone farther than they should have in securities. You know, we, we, we did away with Glass-Steagall, which allowed the banks to get into these securities. I'm not so sure that was a really good idea. But the fact is, yeah. this banking crisis, everybody's safe. Everybody thinks that our entire system is going to collapse. And there's nothing to indicate that that's going to be the case. Everybody across the board is looking to see what's happening, helping to shore up our financial system to make sure that we don't lose any other banks and that a depositors' monies are uh, uh, protected and safe. And I think so, there will be some changes going forward. At least I hope there will be. But you got to find out what all yeah. happened first and not jump to just conclusions because you didn't like the law in the first place. 
OK, so let's, let's, let's talk about what we agree on. We agree on Glass-Steagall. I agree with you that it's not exactly the same as 2008, although clearly it's one of the biggest banking failures in American history. That's a big deal, whether we like it or not. Um, and I agree with you that the interest rates obviously played a role as well. But to say that the deregulation, or you don't even like to call it deregulation, played no role, it's not just Bernie Sanders who called it in 2018, we played the clip, or Elizabeth Warren now. A report by the Roosevelt Institute think tank last week was headlined, and I quote, how 2018 regulatory rollbacks set the stage for the Silicon Valley bank collapse. It said due to the rollback of several key Dodd-Frank provisions, which you supported, regulators did not supervise these banks sufficiently. This allowed them to get into a financial position where they could not withstand runs. Why do you disagree with that? I didn't say I disagreed with that. I never said that I didn't, that I disagreed okay. with the fact that regulators did not uh, regulate appropriately. It looks to me as if they did not do that. The difference is the mandatory uh, regulations that we raise the threshold on versus the tools in their toolbox that are still part of Dodd-Frank. I think, and I may be wrong, if I'm, look, if I'm wrong, I wanna make sure that we get it right going forward and no legislation yeah. like this is sacred, we can change. But the fact is there are plenty of tools in the toolbox that should have caught this, including any bank that is over $100 billion the Fed have the discretion to impose that enhanced um, yeah. regulation, enhanced supervision. So, they didn't do it here because they didn't see it. And by the way, it's not just the Feds. The state authorities apparently didn't do anything either, and they also have a thought. So just to be clear, and you mentioned, you know, you're not wedded to this, there's nothing sacred in there. Just looking at that 2018 bill, which, again, Bernie Sanders stood up in the Senate and said, this will lead to what it led to. And they did lead to the second and third biggest banking failures in American history. Do you have any regrets for your vote? No, for I don't bill? have any regrets because of, yes, it, I don't think, number one, I think at the end of the day, you're going to see that, that that bill in and of itself did not lead to the collapse of SBP or Signature, two banks. I don't think that that happened. I may be wrong. If we do, then I'll revisit this with you. But I think what you're going to see is a lack of supervision with tools that they had going forward right now. And the fact that, you know, Senator Sanders, my, who's a friend, had, did not like this bill. He wanted all banks to have um, much, much more regulation. I represented a lot of banks in the, in the state of Alabama that this really, truly benefited. John Tester in Montana, his banks, even Tim Kaine and uh, Mark Warner in Virginia. There's a lot of banks that are doing a better job for their customers yeah right now because of this rollback. But again, Maddie, and the one thing I hope you and I can agree on here is that everybody needs to be looking at this. Everybody needs to find out exactly yes. what happened. And if this legislation needs to be changed somehow, some way, then I hope both sides of the aisle will absolutely do that. So you talked about representing banks as a senator in Alabama. After you left the Senate, you took a job with the lobbying and law firm Arendt Fox Schiff. On its website, the firm says, quote, we represent banks, insurance companies, bond insurers, credit enhancers, savings and loan institutions, and public pension funds. Senator, what do you say to people who see a revolving door between Congress and the big banks and their lobbyists who say, hey, how come a senator can vote for bank deregulation and then go join a firm that lobbies for banks? It's not a good look, is it? You surely understand why that bothers so many ordinary Americans. Well, you know, big law firms represent a lot of different entities um, across the board. And we have interests that we present up and down uh, the aisle. I was on uh, the Hill today with people with the, with the, the, that are lawyers with the Federal Bar Association trying to help the judiciary. So there's a lot of different things that people do and they look at. But the fact of the matter is, when I look at a bill, and I think people, and you, you followed my career, Maddie, I don't think anybody can say that I, that I did something just because I was looking down the road. In fact, if I'd have done that... I, and I'm not saying I, that, I I'm not saying that Senator. I'm saying the optics. I, I'm not saying that, Senator, to be clear. I'm saying the optics are bad, though, right? You're a politician. You must see that people understandably I, 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 get angry when they see this stuff. If, if, in fact, I have taken a position that was inconsistent with my earlier votes, that could look bad. I'm not taking a position that's inconsistent with my votes. I, and when I got a job, and I think when most former senators that I know that are on both sides of the aisle, they make sure with their employer that they are, they've got certain standards and they're not going to represent certain uh, entities or companies because we just aren't comfortable Understood. doing it. That's the way it is. 
And so I, I, I am very comfortable with what the law firm does. I'm very comfortable with big law firms. And at the end of the day, this is Congress's responsibility along with the president uh, and with the Fed. And they will hear and they will consider all sides so of the argument. You mentioned the Fed. You mentioned interest rates. This Wednesday, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell announced another interest rate hike to fight inflation, this time by a quarter of a percentage point. In light of the bank failures, do you think it's time for Powell, who you voted to confirm as Fed chair, to stop being so hawkish? Layoffs are already hitting lots of industries. House prices are falling as mortgage rates jump. Aren't more rate hikes only going to make life worse for regular Americans and mid-sized banks? You know, I, I'm not a full-blown economist, and I have a lot of confidence in uh, Jay Powell. I think the Fed has done a, a good job in trying to control inflation. They're in a really tough spot right now between what happened uh, with the uh, uh, Silicon Valley and Signature and trying to make sure it doesn't happen anymore, but also still kind of trying to bring inflation. Bringing inflation under control and down is still a priority of the Fed. It's a priority of Congress. It's a priority of the administration. And one of the very few tools that the Fed has to try to do that is to raise interest rates. I thought that the way they handled this one was appropriate because they could have raised rates more, but they saw they're seeing a number of signs. And so they dial that back just enough to see where things go while they are also trying to shore up things and making sure that our system stays going. I think overall, uh, this economy yeah. is not likely to go into recession, and it's because of a lot of the actions that the Fed took. Not that they're perfect, Matty, we all know that, and some things they have to change yeah. and do. But overall, people are working, uh, people are, are making money, and the inflation is coming I, down. I hope you're right about recession and Powell. Last quick question, and I appreciate you coming on and taking my questions as ever. I have to ask about Donald Trump. What is the correct Democratic Party response to his possible indictment in New York and to congressional Republicans, people who cried Benghazi and lock her up and Hunter Biden's laptop, who are now complaining about weaponized law enforcement and threatening to somehow defund, delegitimize the New York district attorney? Right. Well, the correct response, I think, from Democrats is, is to not really comment on a possible indictment. That's up to the grand jury. The one thing that we know is that there are a number of investigations going on, and they're all separate. They're all, in effect, independent counsel, whether it is the DA in Manhattan, the DA in Fulton County, Georgia, the independent counsel with the Department of Justice. They are all working their own investigations. This is not some grand conspiracy of progressives to get Donald Trump. The fact of the matter is Donald Trump's actions have put him in this position. Whether or not a grand jury, and there is so much that we don't know, Maddie, that's going on in that grand jury. We don't know every yes. facet of this. That uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think Democrats should not really comment on the possibility uh, of an indictment. We should let this process play out, notice that it's in the courts, and make sure that people understand that politics, from the, from the Democratic point of view, this is not about politics. This is about whether or not laws were broken and the rule of law and whether or not someone should be held accountable. Former Senator Doug Jones of Alabama, thank you for your time. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Matty.